Welcome back everyone to Satoshi Finance. Today we're delving into the intriguing world of business blunders. You won't believe how these seven companies made costly mistakes that left a mark in corporate history. From millions lost to customers and even the entire company at stake, this video is about to uncover some jaw-dropping lessons in business. So grab your popcorn, hit that like button, and let's jump right into it. Learning from one's own mistakes is undoubtedly valuable, but there's a unique wisdom in learning from the blunders of others. In today's video, we delve into some of the most expensive mistakes made by even the most renowned and colossal companies, some of which are surprisingly amusing. If nothing else, this exploration might bring solace in the thought that any mistakes you've made at work are probably not nearly as significant as these. One of the most colossal missed opportunities in the history of business occurred back in 1999 when Excite found itself a distant second to Yahoo in terms of internet search traffic. Excite was considered the more technologically advanced of the two, being a genuine search engine while Yahoo leaned towards being a web directory. During this period, numerous search engines were in competition, with most of them busy transforming into what was known as internet portals. These portals resembled the front page of the internet, as this was the favoured business model among investors at the time. It's interesting to note that Larry Page and Serge Brin were working on a research project initially nicknamed Backrub, because the system assessed backlinks to estimate a website's importance for ranking in search results. This project was later renamed Google and eventually Alphabet, a term we all use today. In 1999, Larry Page approached Excite's management with an offer to sell his search engine for $750,000, along with some shares in Excite, making the total deal worth approximately $1.6 million. Page's reasoning was that his search algorithm could boost Excite's daily revenues by about $130,000. He envisioned this as a short-term engagement before moving on to more significant endeavors. Unfortunately, Excite declined the offer after comparing the two search engines, primarily because the new search algorithm was lightning fast. Management perceived this as a problem because, in their view, an instantaneous search engine would lead users away from their internet portal. Their advertising revenue depended on users spending time on the portal, so they felt that the new search engine would devalue Excite. As we now know, Google, or rather Alphabet, went on to become one of the world's largest businesses, while Excite struggled eventually merging with a broadband provider named At Home Network, before going bankrupt in 2001. Our next corporate blunder on the list brings us to Lululemon. In 2013, this high-end yoga apparel brand faced a public relations disaster when a batch of its signature black yoga pants was found to be too sheer. Customers voiced their complaints, noting that the pants turned transparent when wearers bent over during yoga classes. As yoga often involves bending over, this issue was especially problematic. The subsequent recall affected approximately 17% of the pants sold in Lululemon stores that year, incurring costs ranging from $12 to $17 million. However, few individuals have made such conspicuous statements as Chip Wilson, the founder of the company. His comments on Bloomberg television regarding the recall were particularly controversial. He remarked, Frankly, some women's bodies just don't actually work for. It's about the rubbing through the thighs and how much pressure is there. These comments ignited a firestorm of controversy, and his seemingly insincere apology on the company's Facebook page did little to appease the outraged customers. Ultimately, Chip Wilson stepped down as chairman of the company's board, and sales have since rebounded. This experience has taught me the importance of refraining from commenting on the appearance of my viewers. Now let's move on to the next topic, Frito-Lay. In 1998, Frito-Lay introduced Wow Chips, which were fat-free versions of popular brands like LA's Ruffles, Doritos, and Tostitos. These chips were made with Alestra, a fat substitute that unfortunately acted as a laxative when consumed in excessive quantities. Initially, these snacks saw explosive sales and became the best-selling new product in the United States during their introduction year. However, due to the problems they caused and the media frenzy surrounding their unpleasant side effects, sales quickly declined. The FDA mandated the addition of a health warning label to products containing Olestra, stating, Olestra may cause abdominal cramping and loose stools. Olestra, unfortunately, hinders the absorption of certain vitamins and nutrients. To address this issue, vitamins A, D, E, and K were added. Now, 
I'm no advertising guru like Don Draper, but from a marketing perspective, this approach falls short. No amount of added vitamins can fully compensate for the concerns raised in the initial sentence of that statement. While this did not cause long-term damage to Frito-Lay as a brand, it's amusing to consider that they might have explored the possibility of introducing their own brand of toilet paper during that time, although no one entertained such an idea back then. Moving on to number four on our list is Kodak. Kodak boasts a rich history of developing and unveiling innovative products. They introduced some of the 20th century's most beloved camera models, such as the Brownie, the Autographic, and the Instamatic. The company's iconic Kodak moment catchphrase even became part of popular culture, signifying an event worthy of immortalization. George Eastman, the company's visionary founder, steered its core business from dry plates to film and from black and white to color. Interestingly, these new product introductions initially impacted the sales of their profitable existing product lines upon their market entry. Several decades later, Kodak missed a golden opportunity to lead the digital photography revolution, despite one of its engineers, Steve Sasson, inventing the digital camera in the company's R&D labs during the 1970s. This technological breakthrough was a testament to Kodak's commitment to research and development. However, merely having the resources and space for innovation isn't sufficient. Effective management is also vital in leveraging the innovations developed by the engineering department. Regrettably, Kodak's leadership rejected the concept of the digital camera, fearing it would cannibalize their established business of selling photographic film. As engineer Sasson later recounted to the New York Times, it was filmless photography, so management's reaction was, that's cute, but don't tell anyone about it. Instead of embracing this innovation, Kodak's management chose to emphasize the flaws in early digital cameras brought to market by their competitors, highlighting issues like slow processing times and low resolutions. Lamentably, their management lacked the vision to recognize the potential utility of good enough digital camera technology for millions of consumers. Predictably, Kodak's competitors seized this opportunity, leaving Kodak to settle for pursuing patent royalties on technology they had developed but failed to capitalize on. In 2007, Kodak's digital camera patent expired and they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2012. Following their emergence from bankruptcy in 2013, the company shifted its focus to providing commercial digital printing products and services, motion picture film, and still camera film. They also licensed the Kodak brand for various products manufactured by other companies. Now let's delve into one of the most renowned blunders in product introductions in history. After World War II, Coca-Cola enjoyed a dominant 60% market share in the cola soft drink industry. However, by 1983, that share had dwindled to under 24%, primarily due to fierce competition from Pepsi. Pepsi was outselling Coca-Cola in supermarkets, and Coca-Cola's leadership position was mainly sustained through its extensive network of soda vending machines and sales to fast food establishments, notably McDonald's. As consumer trends evolved, older individuals became increasingly health and weight conscious, turning to diet drinks. Meanwhile, younger consumers were developing a preference for the sweeter taste of Pepsi. In 1980, when a new CEO assumed leadership, he made it clear that no aspect of the company's operations, including beverage formulations, would be considered off-limits. Coca-Cola embarked on testing a new, sweeter formula that overwhelmingly outperformed both regular Coca-Cola and Pepsi in taste tests, surveys, and focus groups. In a striking display of enthusiasm, one bottling company even threatened legal action against Coca-Cola unless they introduced the new formulation to the market. Notably, during focus groups, approximately 10 to 12% of participants expressed their intention to stop consuming Coca-Cola altogether if the new recipe replaced the old one. This was a clear indicator of the challenges that lay ahead. In 1985, new Coke was introduced to coincide with the 100-year anniversary of the beverage. However, the launch did not proceed as planned. Journalists were quick to highlight the discrepancy between the marketing emphasis on the new formula's sweeter taste and previous Coca-Cola advertising, which had positioned Coca-Cola's less sweet taste as a reason to prefer it over Pepsi. Although New Coke found acceptance among many Coca-Cola drinkers, particularly in the northeastern United States where it was first introduced, it faced resistance elsewhere, especially in the southern states. Comedians and talk show hosts frequently poked fun at the switch, and the company received over 40,000 calls and letters expressing anger and disappointment. 
A few months later, Coca-Cola yielded to public pressure and reintroduced Coca-Cola Classic, featuring the drink's original formula. To this day, some people believe that the introduction of new Coke in the United States was a strategy to conceal the shift from cane sugar to the more cost-effective high-fructose corn syrup. In reality, this change had occurred five years prior to the introduction of New Coke. Ultimately, New Coke was nothing more than a colossal marketing blunder. Although Coca-Cola had access to focus group data indicating a preference for the new taste, the company failed to consider the deep emotional connection that its most loyal consumers had with the brand. Park research has spearheaded numerous groundbreaking innovations, including the computer mouse, the graphical user interface, what you see is what you get, word processing software, and Ethernet technology for networking computers. In 1979, Steve Jobs, accompanied by a group of Apple employees, successfully negotiated two visits to Xerox Park. Xerox was considering an investment in Apple prior to its IPO, scheduled for the following year in 1980. Larry Tesla, one of the researchers at Park, vividly recalls the barely contained excitement of Apple's co-founder when he witnessed the developments at Xerox Park. Jobs was so thoroughly impressed during his visit that he decided his upcoming Lisa computer must incorporate many of the concepts he had observed, notably including the mouse. Jobs proceeded to incorporate several of the innovations he had seen at Xerox. In 1994, he even initiated a lawsuit against Microsoft alleging that Windows had copied the look and feel of the Macintosh operating system, which, ironically, he had borrowed from Xerox. During the course of this legal battle, Xerox filed a lawsuit against Apple, asserting that Apple had violated copyrights Xerox held for its graphical user interface. However, the district court dismissed Xerox's claims without determining whether Apple's interface infringed Xerox's rights, deferring the decision to the Copyright Office. In the Microsoft lawsuit, Apple was unsuccessful in most of its claims, except for a ruling that the trash can icon and folder icons from Hewlett Packard's New Wave Windows application had infringed on their copyright. The Xerox Alto computer that Jobs encountered in 1979 was remarkably ahead of its time. It featured the keyboard and mouse interface that remains in use today, advanced word processing software, and forward-thinking concepts like event reminders. Unfortunately, Xerox's senior management in upstate New York failed to recognize the potential of what had been developed in Palo Alto. Instead, they perceived the Alto computer as an overly intricate workstation with a hefty price tag of $40,000 each and concluded that there was no viable market for it. Xerox ultimately funded the production of only 2,000 units and never proceeded with its commercial release. Much like Kodak, Xerox had developed cutting-edge technology but lacked the vision to capitalize on it. A copyright lawyer, commenting during the Microsoft lawsuit in 1990, remarked that Xerox had delayed filing a copyright infringement case for too long and had resorted to a weaker charge of unfair competition. He observed, I think it's unfortunate because Apple is pursuing Microsoft and Hewlett Packard over concepts they borrowed from Xerox. Now, moving on to the final entry on our list, BlackBerry. Not too long ago, the go-to smartphone for professionals, including bankers, lawyers, and business executives, was the BlackBerry. It was an iconic smartphone featuring a physical keyboard and a distinctive side-mounted wheel. It earned the moniker Crackberry due to its users' heavy reliance on it. Even President Obama famously refused to part with his BlackBerry when he assumed office in 2009. Even in their initial iterations, iPhones didn't quite live up to expectations. I remember purchasing an iPhone 3, which I still own today. It was so underwhelming as a phone that I quickly reverted to my BlackBerry, relegating the iPhone to serve as an MP3 player. Then came the iPhone 4, plagued by a notorious cellular reception issue that required a peculiar grip to function properly. Apple's solution? They sold a rubber band that covered the antenna for $1.29 ostensibly improving the phone's cellular reception. The first iPhone made its debut in 2007, but it wasn't until the iPhone 5 arrived in 2012 that it truly excelled as a phone. Meanwhile, BlackBerry had a substantial head start and ample time to refine its product. Regrettably, they failed to do so until it was too late. When the iPhone and Android devices, which shared a similar design philosophy, entered the scene, the computing industry was shifting toward larger touchscreen displays an evolution Apple capitalized on brilliantly. While the tech landscape was undergoing this transformation, 
BlackBerry remained fixated on safeguarding its existing market share rather than innovating. To be fair, their rationale was somewhat justifiable. Numerous major businesses and government entities relied on Blackberries for their robust security, dependable email services, swappable batteries, ideal for business trips, and durability, even surviving an accidental laundry cycle, as I personally experienced. BlackBerry Messenger even succeeded in making a business-oriented device appealing to a younger audience. However, at a juncture when the mobile phone industry was rapidly evolving and consumers were beginning to favor feature-rich high-end phones, BlackBerry's strategy was to make minor, incremental improvements to cater to its established high-end business clientele. This conservative approach, coupled with a failure to anticipate the changing desires of the average consumer, compounded BlackBerry's woes. Moreover, BlackBerry displayed overconfidence by presuming that its customer base would endure a lack of innovation and continue to remain loyal. They, along with Adobe, insisted that Flash was the future of rich mobile content, delaying the release of a more contemporary smartphone until they had a processor powerful enough to meet Flash's requirements. BlackBerry's faith in customers waiting for their superior product or tolerating limitations simply because it was BlackBerry proved misplaced. While businesses and government clients did stick around for a considerable period, primarily due to BlackBerry's superior security features, the company was too late to introduce the Z1, a genuinely competitive phone. By that point, app developers had lost interest in crafting software for an operating system that hardly anyone was using. While the Z1 was indeed impressive, it suffered from a significant drawback, a lack of available apps. BlackBerry phones have now become officially obsolete and inoperable. In January 2022, the company's CEO confirmed the decommissioning of the infrastructure comprising the operating system, software and services that had endured for two decades. The company still exists today with a renewed focus on cybersecurity and encryption-based services primarily tailored for the medical and automotive industries. The BlackBerry saga serves as a compelling reminder that even if you establish a substantial lead, failure to adapt to evolving circumstances can lead to downfall. Now, before you go, I'd like to ask a small favor. If you enjoyed what you saw, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It's totally free, and you can change your mind at any time. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when we drop fresh, exciting content. Your support means the world to us, and it helps this channel grow. So, go ahead, click that subscribe button, join our incredible community, and let's explore more amazing content together. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.